Good morning, folks. My name is Mosala, one of the elders here at Grace Gen. Uh, it is a privilege for me once again to share God's word with you. Uh, just to orientate you, we are still busy with a series based on the book of Hebrews that we have titled Christ is Greater. And uh, this morning we are speaking on what I've titled simply Grow Up. And it is the same text as what Gary shared on uh, last week, which is um, chapter 5, verse 11, to chapter 6, verse 3. So I'm going to ask us to read it, and then we will start. It reads as follows. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ, doctrine of Christ, and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. This we will do if God permits let us pray. So Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that it will be like milk to us and solid food and that we would uh, train ourselves and practice so that we may grow in the knowledge of Christ. Be lifted up, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And so what we are going to do this morning is look at a topic um, uh, and really look at it in three headings. Number one, we're going to look at the diagnosis and, and uh, this, uh, the way of framing this is really something I've stolen from Gary. We are looking at diagnosis, we are looking at remedy, and then we're going to look at steps to growing in Christ. Diagnosis, remedy, and growth in Christ. But first, by way of introduction, let us look at what has been happening so far in this book. When a person writes a book, the, the writer has an advantage to the reader because they already know where they are going. So it seems to me that the writer has given us hints to this diagnosis through the prescriptions that he has already given from chapter 2 uh, right through to chapter 5. And then from chapter 5, verse 11, then he begins to give, to give us a diagnosis of the problems that were facing these Hebrew uh, believers. And what is those clues? And it's important for us to take note of them because if we don't, we will misunderstand the diagnosis. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says we need to Pay close attention to the message, lest we drift away from Christ. So he's saying pay attention. Secondly, in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Consider Jesus, who is the apostle and high priest of our faith. Thirdly, he says, Do not harden your heart. Chapter 3, verse 8. 3, verse 12, he says, Take care, lest you have an evil heart of unbelief. 4, verse 1, Fear lest you fail to enter God's rest. 4.11, be diligent to enter God's rest, lest you, 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 lest you fall by disobedience. And then lastly, 4 verse 14, hold fast to your confession. It's very important that we pay attention to, to all of these uh, prescriptions and warnings that he's given to us. He's saying to us, pay attention, consider Jesus, 
Do not harden your heart. Take care. Fear. Be diligent. Hold fast. And if you look carefully at all of those warnings and imperatives, two things emerge. Number one, there is a focus on the centrality of Christ. We need to consider Jesus and we need to look to him and hold fast to our confession. And then secondly, there is a theme of the heart that is coming out. Do not harden your heart. Take care. Fear. So that you do not develop a heart of unbelief. And so this puts us in a better position to then understand what he means when he comes to the diagnosis. And so let's look at the diagnosis of the problem. He only gets to it in our text from chapter 5, verse 11. And I could summarize it with two words or three words. Dullness of hearing, he says. That's the crux of the problem. That is what is confronting these believers. They have become or are in danger of dullness of hearing. And so in order to unpack it, I would like for us to first look at dullness and then we'll look at the two words together, what dullness of hearing means. The word dullness means to be slow or to be sluggish. And in the normal use of the word, we think of a dull person or sluggish person as somebody who, who is intellectually impaired, uh, a dom cop, a hot cop, <laughs> blockhead. <laughs> and so we think of dullness in that sense. But if you have paid attention to all the instructions that the writer has given, you begin to realize that the problem here is not the head at all. But the problem here is the problem of the heart. They, they hear what God is saying. They are exposed to the very oracles of God. But the problem is when these oracles of God come, they hit a rocky heart. heart. And when they find that hard heart, uh, there is, that heart does not produce forth obedience. Uh, to God and even worse it produces rebellion which le leads to destruction and one way of, um, of unpacking and understanding this properly is to look at the opposite of what he brings to us as the opposite of dullness uh, or dullness of hearing and we see that in chapter 6 verse 11 and 12 and I'll just read it for us it says and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. So here he's challenging the hearers and he's saying to them, I want you to show forth earnestness or diligence. Look at what he says in verse 12. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That word that is translated in our version sluggish, in the Greek it is exact same word for dullness, nothroi. What is, it, it's exact same thing. And the opposite of that is earnestness. It says don't be sluggish, but rather be earnest. And then he says, when you are earnest, what is going to happen is you are going to have full assurance of hope. In other words, he's saying the message of hope, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, entering into your mind and through to your heart can and should produce fullness of the assurance of hope. And in this case, it obviously does not because these guys are sluggish instead of being earnest and diligent in God. And so we need to, uh, uh, to see that in its proper context for us to understand the problem. And so let's now put the two words together. What does dullness of hearing mean? And so you will see, and perhaps we should read 
chapter 3 uh, from verse 15 in order to uh, then understand what it means to be dull, to have dullness of hearing. It says, it reads as follows. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left, not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned? whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And so this tells us that the opposite of dullness of hearing is hearing with faith. And this was a problem. And the problem was really at the level of the heart. And the symptoms of the problem is captured in those words, rebellion, disobedience. And the result of that was the provocation of God and God swearing that they would not enter his rest. And so you will see as we have I've said many times here is that when you see acts of disobedience and re uh, in your heart, um, if you scratch underneath that disobedience, what you are going to find is you are going to find idolatry. What here in our text this speaks about rebellion. Underneath the act of disobedience, there is idolatry. But if you scratch under idolatry, and by the way, idolatry is nothing other than anything that you prefer uh, as superior to God. Anything that you find your significance on. And it pushes you to reject God's word and to cling on to that very thing. That is idolatry. That is rebellion. And underneath that rebellion, there is gospel unbelief. And so our text is telling us these guys didn't enter the rest. And instead they were disobedient. And their disobedience was really coming out of their rebellion and idolatry. But the key problem is the heart. And isn't it what God has always had to deal with, uh, particularly with the people of Israel? He would say, for example, that these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far removed. The issue is with our hearts. Our hearts need to hear God's word. And on the positive, when we uh, have hearts that hear God, that see minds, eyes, that see God as magnificent and beautiful and compelling, that kind of attitude is going to be receptive to God's word God's word is going to produce faith and faith is going to produce acts of righteousness, acts of obedience. And those acts of obedience prove the genuineness of the faith of the person who possesses it. And this kind of a person who's got a heart of faith, who trusts in Almighty God, who's entered the rest, and continues to strive to enter the rest. Note the tension of entering and yet pressing on to enter into God's rest. And the reformers refer to them as people who have piety. Uh, and I would like uh, to quote here from John Calvin, how he defines piety. He says, piety is that reverence joined with love of God which the knowledge of his benefits induces. And his, uh, let me pause there for a second. It is such a beautiful and crisp statement. He's saying that piety, a, a, a life that of obedience before God, comes out of two things. Number one, reverence. In other words, there's an attitude of honor and fear of God. And then he says, and that 
attitude is joined with the love of God. And, and by love there, he means a verb. Actions. That, that in, in obedience to God's word. And then he says, those two things, that reverence and love of God, um, are induced by the knowledge of God's benefits. I just can't do better than that. That is true faith. And that is true works of righteousness as opposed to legalism. Legalism wants to reverence God and to love God so that God will come to love us. But says John Calvin, reverence and true works of obedience that are pleasing to God spring out of the knowledge of the benefits of God. First, your heart is convinced that God is compellingly beautiful and for you. And the knowledge of God's benefits then produces reverence and love out of us. And then he continues to say, piety exists when men recognize that they owe everything to God, that they are nourished by his fatherly care, that he is the author of their very good. In other words, piety, a life that is pleasing unto God, really comes out of a heart that realizes just how dependent we are and helpless we are and how we owe everything to God and his grace and his love and his care for us. And so when you go back to our text again, we will see that the writer, after telling us about this diagnosis of dullness of heart, he really gets into, into, into some uh, pairs. First, it's the negative pairs, three of them. And then as we go into chapter 6, he then brings positive pairs. And when you look at these pairs, you see that he's basically saying there is no no man's land in the things of God. Either you are growing to maturity or you are drifting away from Christ to your destruction. And in the end, it will prove that y you had no faith. It, your faith was not genuine. You, you, you fail to enter rest because of unbelief ultimately in your heart. So let's look, today we are not looking, going to be looking at the positive pairs, but I will just mention them in passing. We'll do that, God willing, next week. But the negative pairs are the pairs of teachers and those who are taught. Secondly, of milk and of solid food. Thirdly, of the children and the mature. And then on the positive side, he gives us three positive pairs. Repentance and faith, washings and laying on of hands, uh, resurrection and eternal judgment. But the point I want to make here is that if we are to take heed of the writer's message, we are going to have to do two things. Number one, we're going to have to train. And number two, we're going to have to practice. Uh, let's um, remind ourselves what he says in verse 14. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Training is means discipline with the purpose of godliness. Uh, a disciple is somebody who is disciplined and who disciplines themselves and trains themselves to the end of godliness. And practice means a habit formed by deliberate effort. And uh, before I step off of this point, I want us to notice one thing about this dullness of hearing. Did you notice that a teaching is a two-way stream? It is not a one-way street. He's telling us there, let me read verse 11 again. Uh, about this we have much to say. And by the way, when he says this, about this, it is taking us back to uh, Jesus Christ being a priest in the order of Melchizedek. 
He's saying that is, um, that is the representative of what he calls maturity, solid food. He says, I want to go to solid food. I want to talk to you about how Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He says, and even though I've got much to say to you, um, but since you've become dull of hearing, it is hard to explain. <laughs> I don't think the writer of the book of Hebrews uh, had difficulties in teaching. What he's here saying is that I have a great ability to teach, but I can't do it and I'm abandoning it because there is no positive response on your part. You, by this time, you're supposed to be teachers, yet you are needing somebody to train you. The very elementary principles of Christ. And so what he's saying is that if you want to grow in Christ, whatever it is that you learn, through practice, through training, you need to teach it to somebody else. And if you are going to do that, then you are going to grow muscle spiritually and you will be able to outgrow the elementary principles of Christ. Let's now come to our point number two very briefly, the remedy. Now that we see the diagnosis, what is the remedy? I won't spend much time on this because of time. But the remedy here is not so much uh, the prescription that he gave earlier, but it is what the medical people would call primary health care, <laughs> preventative uh, medicine. What do you need to do to avoid getting contaminated by this virus that produces this disease of dullness of hearing? And then he gives us that in chapter 6. In chapter 6, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Let's look at the word leaving. Normally when you leave something, you don't pay attention to it no, anymore. But actually, here he means leaving, <clears throat> not by abandoning the basic principles of Christ, but taking them as God's milk, these fundamentals, and then training and developing muscle through milk so that you will become strong enough for you to eat solid food. And I want you to see that both the elementary principles and the mature stuff, both of them are Christ-centered. He calls these three pairs the elementary principles of Christ. And yet when he talks about Melchizedek, again we see Christ because he's saying, I wanted to talk to you about Melchizedek, difficult doctrines. But Melchizedek shows us that Jesus Christ is a priest in the same order of Melchizedek. So again, there is a Christ-centeredness there. So if we will take God's word, the basic principles as milk, and if we will train and practice, it is going to explode in faith in our hearts. And that faith is going to lead to acts of righteousness. Third and lastly, how do we grow in Christ? Uh, again, I'm going to just state it briefly. Uh, first of all, we grow in, through milk to maturity by learning to depend on God, as John Calvin says. Secondly, by trusting in God and obeying God, as the songwriter says, must trust and obey, for there is no way to become happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Lastly, by attaining greater levels of understanding, growing into the difficult doctrines. And he's about to get into doctrines of elections and election and, and sovereignty of God and those difficult doctrines. I want to close with this uh, from John, First John 2, verse 11 to 14. We are told of three categories of people, children, young men and fathers and children in that context i believe it speaks of all the people of god it says are those who know god's forgiveness and know him as a father the young men are those who are strong and who have overcome you see that there is 
practice, they give themselves to God's word. And the fathers are those who know him who is from the beginning, who because of giving themselves to God's word, uh, they, there is strength that they get, there is revelation that they get, and they grow in knowledge and grow in maturity, and they are able to live a legacy of a father because they have been uh, disciples. So lastly, I want to challenge us. Will you and I grow? Do you realize that either you are growing in Christ to maturity or you are drifting to destruction? The stakes are so high. So I encourage all of us to grow up in Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you that your word is a means of grace that awakens us so that we may not drift to our destruction, but rather that we would grow to maturity. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.